Hello everyone and welcome to another RPM Technic Talk podcast. Um, I'm Greg, you've heard of me many, many times now and uh, welcoming in with us today I've got Dave Lee. Say hello Dave. Hello there. So uh, Dave is our senior engine technician and um, well, to start at the beginning, tell us a bit about what you do for us Dave. Uh, it's uh, primarily building engines, a lot of modified engines as well that we're doing now. Um, 964 mods seem to be a, a real popular thing at the moment, 3.8 um, capacity increase uh, mm. along with throttle bodies, um, different exhaust systems, so it's, it's quite a, an interesting package yes. um, that's gone together. So um, we've developed a lot of our own bits on it, like our own profiler cams and things like that. So it, it's, yeah, it's quite a, a unique sort of RPM thing that um, that's yeah, good fun to build there. It's just a bit different to the run of the mill stuff. <laughs> Definitely. Well, I thought it'd be quite interesting to chat with you today because a lot of the stuff, um, engineering wise, that goes on behind the scenes, historically, we've never been the best at telling everyone what we've done. And years mm -hmm. down the line, people go, Oh my gosh, didn't realize you, you lads, did that. So, obviously, you're kind of at the forefront of doing a lot of the R&D with us. Yeah. So, um, hence having a chat. So, if we start right at the beginning, what, mm -hmm. um, how did you get into building engines and gearboxes? Uh, well, I, I, when I left school, I did my apprenticeship with um, what is now JZ Mac Tech or JZM. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, uh, yeah, worked work there for many years. Um, uh, learning the, the trade in general, just doing mm -hmm. a lot of service work and, and sort of engine, um, you know, just basic tuning work there. Um, I then actually went off to, to a, a restorers after that, a Porsche restoring company. Um, and that's where I, I sort of almost sort of self taught with doing gearboxes and more engine work, mm -hmm. uh, calling on ad advice from previous colleagues. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so then actually finished up going back to uh, JZM when it, when it restarted again. and. Uh, uh, at, at that stage, I was then doing engines and transmissions for them. So, uh, and it's kind of what I, I enjoy doing most of all. Mm. Always did really. So, uh, I, I sort of managed to find my way into doing that pretty much as as a sole thing, rather rather than um, doing much else on the rest of the car. And if we uh, go back to the start, what, what was it about engines and gearboxes that? Particularly attracted you because a lot of engineers get yeah. frightened when they look at that sort of thing, don't they? Uh, well, yeah. Ironically, that was partly it. I mean, engines. <laughs> I'd, I'd always been interested. I mean, I was pulling, lawn, you know, my dad's lawnmower engine apart from as early as I can remember. Much uh, to his pleasure. Oh yeah, yeah. Because I, I couldn't put it back together <laughs> again at the time. But um, yeah, yeah. I just, I, I honestly don't know what the reason is, but I just had a fascination for for engines. They, yeah, just something about the yeah. the mechanics of it that, that appealed to me. So that was always always there. Gearboxes actually was the fact that it was. I remember, like when I was much younger, thinking, "Oh, gearboxes, that must be a nightmare. I'd never get involved in that." Um, because I found my, it myself in a position at the restorers that I could, um, you know, just do a little bit. And I was, I was very lucky there that I was, I was given the opportunity. It didn't matter how long I spent doing something, mm -hmm. as long as I got it right. So it gave me the chance to take my time and, and learn it and I did more and more and I think it was having overcome the fear of doing it yeah. that then made me think actually this is really cool because <laughs> <Yeah>, <laughs> you know I love doing transmissions now so I know yeah. and I've popped in here many a time and uh, seen you taking gearboxes apart so we we're actually sat in the engine room as we speak yeah. and uh, after about three sentences you lose me um, <laughs> but what and I obviously we've known each other for quite a while now but mm. what always fascinates me is that you're self-taught yeah. How did you yeah. self teach yourself something well, you didn't I mean, understand? It, to be fair to Porsche, their manuals are very good. Yeah. Um, so it was a case of just sitting down with a manual, really studying it. And I think the first gearbox I did was an old 915 gearbox off, off an early car, yeah. which had a, a, a happened to have a reverse fault. Mm -hmm. um, and reverse is just behind the end cover. So it was a, I didn't have to take much apart. Yeah. And it was all about gradually building up confidence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, right up to where we are now and doing, you know, GT4 gearboxes and things like that, which are, you know, absolutely at the other end of the spectrum in terms of the complexity. So, um, you know, it, it's all been about literally building up the confidence and, and then you can start to see parallels between all the different gearboxes. So there's things yeah. that you get familiar with. So whether it's a, a you know, an early 915 gearbox or a, a you know, a G50 out of a 964 or something like that. There's enough familiarity there that it takes the fear out of it and you kind of keep moving on and it's just gone on like that over the years. Yeah. So now it's actually quite exciting when, when you look yeah, at gearbox you haven't done before, <laughs> yeah. Because it's, it's, then it's a, a challenge again. And the GT4 was a real challenge because that, that had a lot of differences. Yeah. I should probably give our listeners some context. That yeah. How long have you been doing engines and gearboxes for? Um, a, uh, about 
32 years now. So, uh, yeah. guess his age on a postcard. Yeah. <laughs> Be kind. <laughs> Don't look a day over 21. Do you? Um, but, but yeah, that, that is... And, and it's something you couldn't probably do anymore because 32 years ago, mm. the value of the cars, of some of those cars, were obviously probably at their lowest ebb. Yeah. So, making an error... The consequences won't, won't quite as magnified oh, as they absolutely. are now. Yeah, no, that no, that's right. That is definitely the case. No I mean, one would it, take a risk yeah. nowadays. No, go and have, give that a well experience. That's yeah, right. Work experience yeah. guy. Yeah, but yeah. I mean that that is one of the benefits here is that we you know you know as a group here we tend to sort of we're happy to give things a try. Yeah, you know a lot of, there's a lot of jobs we do here that people wouldn't you know most places wouldn't touch because of the risk mm. involved of things going wrong. But you know we. We're prepared to sort of give things a go, and uh, yeah. you know it's a steep learning curve. But it's <laughs> yeah, well, again, as you say, some of the the mods that we've done are mm. are solely. I, I sometimes don't think people quite understand sort of where we're at with. For example, mm. when we first did the GT4 transmissions, yeah, there's some guys in America that obviously had a, a one solution. Yeah. Our solution was the the whole of the Cranwell and Pinion to That's right. six yeah. gears and. Obviously, we have a, an option to, to lengthen the, the sixth gear on its own, but mm -hmm. that started from zero. Yeah, we oh, just absolutely. took a, a box yeah. out, didn't we? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think anyone else in the UK had done one at that stage. So, um, you know, to the point where we couldn't buy any tools, so I had to make all the tooling to do it. Mm. Um, which so, you love doing. Which I do like doing, <laughs> so that, that, that wasn't a chore. Um, no, so I mean, yeah, it was a case of making everything as we went along, working out how it came apart. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it is quite different to, to previous Porsche gearboxes. Yeah. I mean, partly because it's, it's actually derived from a Volkswagen gearbox so uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so um you know it's 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 got more Volkswagen heritage in it perhaps than than Porsche so uh, um so a lot of the tooling that that is pretty uniform on earlier Porsche gearboxes didn't apply to this one so yeah. um yeah there, there is more available for them now but in the early days the, the yeah even parts were very very difficult to get mm. Um, so yeah, it was a it was a big challenge. But do you think that in itself is what you find quite satisfying? Because oh, definitely, it's an yeah. end-to-end -end solution. You're yeah. making the tools, yeah. you're designing the wearable. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And it, it's it's great to think that you're doing something that very few people have done before. Mm. Um, so it's yeah, it, I, I like I like that challenge. It, it's it's good. Yeah. But I say that again, that comes back to the fact a lot of places wouldn't have taken that on to mm. try and develop it because you know if if you know if you got stuck halfway through it. <laughs> and couldn't, rip, couldn't get it back together again. I think you that's know. what frightened me halfway through yeah. when you go, there, there's no one else here to answer the question no, and pick up right. the pieces. It's no, going to no, be that's up right. to you. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I guess you go into it with, you know, with your you know your arsenal up your sleeve, knowing well, the previous I, things yeah, you've done. Yeah, I do, but it's also the fact that you know to have the opportunity to try and do that is 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 great. Mm. You know, um, which as I say, most places I don't think would would take a chance on it. So no. uh, to have the opportunity to to sort of look into something completely new like that is quite exciting. I'm not sure if that makes us inspired or deranged, but probably yeah, somewhere somewhere in the middle. Too, somewhere <laughs> <I think. laughs> um, and obviously you've known my business partner, Ollie, yep. um, probably a, at the same length of time. Did you guys start uh, your friendship at the same? Very similar, yeah. I think probably I've met him after, I've probably only been in the trade a couple of years. So, mm. um, so yeah, pretty much all our working lives we've uh, known each other. Intermingled. So, and there's yeah. a few of the lads here with the same yep. sort of thing where you guys are all the band of brothers that got back a together absolutely again. well Chris Boyce who, who's in the um, projects department now he um, you know he, he was my mentor when I started when I got into yeah. the trade originally I was put with him because uh, he, he was at what was Mac Tech Tuning at the time which is mm. the one that became uh, JZM so uh, yeah he, he basically you know led me from the start and uh, so yeah I'm very grateful to him for, for setting me on the right track. Definitely. Yeah. I always like uh, Chris's uh, sentence that when Ollie got uh, sufficiently established, he'd come and join him. And he yeah. did. Yeah, you know, absolutely. You, yeah. That's yeah. rare in this day and age. So yeah. sticking to yeah. the word like that. Absolutely. Because yeah. he was 30 years at the last place, wasn't he? Or something? Oh, yeah. Long, yeah, he'd been there for a while before mm. I first started in it. So, yeah. He, yeah, I don't know. Long, long yeah. time. Yeah. And it's, I think it's quite nice now because everyone kind of has. You know, as a, as, a, as a working environment, we digress mm. from engines a little bit here, yeah. but everyone has the same ethos on how we do things, yes. you know, how we approach a solution, yeah. you know, and, and obviously sometimes when things go wrong is how we how we get them sorted out. But yeah. but I guess we could all um, link that all the way back up to Boise. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yeah, because uh, yeah, all, all the rest of us here that, that have come from from there have, have all sort of basically yeah yeah been taught by Boise. Do you teach anything now? 
I, I, I'm not going to say I teach him anything now, but I, th- I think probably remind him of things. Maybe. Yeah, I think I think I think we work well together. You know, yeah. you, you know, we've known each other so long, we kind of know how each other work now. So, uh, mm. you know, we, we often we finish up doing odd jobs together, like on the nine five nines and that kind of thing. We, yeah. we we sort of team up for doing the nine five nine stuff. So, um, yeah, it's actually it's it's actually really cool to. To still be sort of working, working together. together with Chris yeah. after such a long time. You know, so. Well, I was going to ask about that a little bit later, but we mm. touched on it, so we may as well um, jump into that. So, mm-hmm. have you ever? So, we've just recently rebuilt a nine five nine engine, yep. um, ground up. So, again, I don't recall ever seeing anywhere anyone else do that in the UK. I'm sure they have, but yeah, you know. I mean, my understanding is that you know, pretty much up to this point, all the 959 work has pretty much gone to Reading as a matter of course. Mm. Um, I, I don't know how much of it they do in house or whether the cars go back to Germany now. Mm. Um, but I'm, I'm, again, I'm not aware of anyone else in the UK that, that's, you know, an independent that's done a, um, a, an engine. So, uh, um, but as, as it happens, it's, it's very, very similar to um, GT1 mm. engine, um, which I've done, those sort of cars before, Casual. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, it was only because I remember when I did the GT1, there's so many of the part numbers, they were 959 numbers. It's, Interesting, it's, yeah. A lot of the engine is the same, same oil pump, chain ramps, all, all the valve gear is the same. So, though, who's, so, those of you who are listening who are maybe not quite as, as nerdy as uh, myself, or, or definitely <laughs> Dave, so the GT1s were the uh, the race cars built, to yeah, like Le Mans in the Le Mans. mid 90s, right. is that? Uh, yes, yes, early it was, to mid 90s, yeah. 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 So they followed yeah. on from the 959 engine build. Um, so yeah. in terms of um, starting that project, where mm. it would, was it, well, actually knowing from what you answered about two seconds ago, mm-hmm. you, it's something you approached with glee rather than fear. Oh, well, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, again, I, I, you know, it's all, all the Porsche race engines, basically, they, again, it's a bit like the gearboxes. You can see how they progress. Mm. It, it's very rare that Porsche come up with something completely new. They generally tend to improve on what they've already worked out works for them. Yeah. So um, you know, going right back to things like the nine three fives, with nine three five is is for all intents and purposes a very heavily modified um, nine thirty turbo engine. Yeah. Um, but you can see how that's progressed. They obviously went through some more major changes where they went to like four cam mm-hmm. um, rather than two cam and that kind of thing. But they, it's all the progression. So um, you know, having done the GT one engine, the nine five nine engine. Um, is so similar that that you're not. It's not like you're approaching the whole thing, and the whole thing is is different. Mm-hmm. You, there's lots of it that's familiar, and therefore all you actually have to learn about then are the the more limited number of items that, that are different. So yeah. between the GT1 and the 959, really, it's the induction system okay. and the way that the exhaust system works that, that mm-hmm. is different. The core yeah. engine is, for all intents and purposes, exactly the same. So um, you know that's the thing. It's kind of when you come on to do a new or an engine from Porsche that you haven't done before, mm-hmm. the chances are quite a bit of it is, is stuff that's familiar to you already. Yeah. So you're not, you're not, it's not like trying to learn how to build an entirely different engine every time. Yeah. It's always a progression. And it's interesting to see what they've changed, what they haven't. Mm. Um, you know. uh, and that's where, I guess, you know, okay, it can be written down on a book and mm. you know, anyone that's studious enough could probably you know, teach themselves mm. to a degree. But when you've built the amount of engines that yourself mm. obviously has built over the years, you know, I guess you take a part out of the engine and can go, I know which engine that's from, mm-hmm. and then you can probably even, you know, compare it. The G previous generation had a little mod here, and the next yeah, generation absolutely. had a mod there. Yeah, yeah. And there's going to be a, a, a point of which you will retire eventually, probably, <laughs> <laughs> where you wonder how that's going to get followed up because you know we find it quite yeah. hard to get apprentice engines. It, it is very difficult. It. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's there's, there's it, there's no rocket science behind it. Mm. You know, any good engine builder can build any of these engines. You do yourself a disjustice, but yes. well, no, no. But it, it genuinely, that's true. You know, mm. in terms of actually putting it together, mm. if you can build a 911 SC engine, you, you can build a 962 engine. It's not, it, it, <laughs> it, you know, technically, it's not any more finding difficult. someone to trust who's different. Well, possibly, <laughs> um, but it. it, it yeah, what, what you can't get out of a book is the experience of, of like you say, recognising what's what and... What, what know, it's supposed to look like if there's damage it, or where. Exactly, yeah. and, and, and you know, things like, for example, on a 962 engine, having mentioned that, the instead of having um, chain drive for the cams, it's actually gear-driven. Mm. Um, and obviously, if you do anything to, that alters the, the height of the cylinders or anything like that, then it, it, it immediately sets the, the, 
mesh of all the gears up differently and so mm -hmm. you have to then re read all them and there's a selection of gears that you have to get to, to do that so it's all about just knowing that you you know in that particular case I know if I do certain things that engine I then need to do other things to make it work properly yeah um, and they're the things that aren't necessarily in books and you know it's very that. limited yeah I mean when I when I, I the last time I was, well uh, yeah it was a 3.2962 engine that I did and and there's, there was hardly any information out there at all mm. um, so a lot of it was drawn against experience from other engines um, where I could and, and basically yeah just making inquiries to anybody in the world literally that, that had had any experience of them and gradually putting all that information together so mm. it, it, is, it is difficult it's lack of information on some of the rarer Porsche stuff is a difficulty because obviously Porsche Motorsport have never really put that information out there in, yeah. into the public domain so um, it can be difficult to get the technical info sometimes. Whilst we're talking technical mm. um, I just go back one stage um, can you explain to people listening what the difference is between chain driven and cam driven engines and why they're different well chain, chain driven or gear driven yeah. um, cha chain fundamentally the, the, with a chain driven camshaft the, the, the thing that can happen is the chains can stretch yeah. they can potentially break as well mm -hmm. um, although I can't honestly say I've ever seen a broken timing chain in so a 911 engine but and again so 911s have had them from 64 absolutely to yeah and they yeah. still do um you know the yeah the 959 the gt1 they're all chain driven still mm. um i'm not really sure why they went to gear driven um cams for the um for the 962s um other than perhaps at that time somebody thought it was another belt and braces thing to There's one less thing to break it, exactly yeah. yeah i mean it's very unlikely you're ever gonna you know you can have a gear failure um yeah. And obviously, that you don't suffer with the stretch problem. I mean, it, as, as an aside to that, the um, Porsche produced an engine years and years ago called, the, I think it was a PFM three thousand two hundred, which was a. I've never was, heard of this. Well, so it, this it, was, it was an aircraft engine. Ah, it, 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 okay. was, it was basically it was based primarily on a three two Greyer engine, I think, mm. um, but then it was it was modified to, to make it. Um, you know, so they could get a certificate to fly. Okay. So it had to have twin ignition systems, that kind of thing, which is mm. normal on, on in aviation. But that had gear driven cams. And I think, again, that was a safety thing so that it could not fail. There's less things to break. E exactly, yeah. yeah. So um, I don't know what the timings are. It's possible mm. that that happened around the time that 962 engine was being redeveloped and they thought, well, we could use it in that as well. Mm. Um, I don't honestly know, I've never looked into it, but um, but it might be that's the reason why and ultimately they decided it, you know, the, the game wasn't enough that. and they went back to change yeah. again afterwards. You know. And it's interesting, well, it's, I don't know whether it was luck or by design that you got into Porsches because yeah. they do have some, you know, going right back even to the 50s, some of the technical Mm. You know, designs of how they put things together. Yeah, you know, it's no surprise they won so many endurance races. Is yeah, was it luck right. or judgment that you got involved with Porsches? Um, it it was, it was more luck really. Yeah. I mean, my my first car was a an old thirteen hundred Beetle. So I thought about saying nine eleven. No, sadly <laughs> not. So uh, no, I mean, uh, you know, so it, uh, kind of I, I mean, and that was only because you know all my mates at school were getting them. Thought, oh, yeah. yeah, I'll have one of those. So that kind of introduced me to you know. Flat air cooled engines, engines. <laughs> um, but yeah, there was I, I hadn't sort of really had well I hadn't had any involvement with anything to do with Porsche before that. Yeah. Um, but it just so happened that both my, my younger brothers went to school with the kids of the guy that owned Backtech Tuning back in the day. Ah, okay. um, and so when I left school, I, I I went down there and asked if I could do a bit of work experience, and and that was it. Once I was in there, it just went yeah, on from there and never looked back so um so yeah it was a it was a fairly chance thing but yeah. but having said that once i sort of got into it you do start to appreciate how the how yeah. porsche engineering it's you know, really so was clever. quite ahead of i of mean we're, we're blinkered well maybe i'm blinkered we're blinkered because of obviously we deal with them every day oh, yeah, and you yeah. just you just fall in love with the product but it, you know every time i come in here to mm. you know i'd make a nuisance of myself what's this do dave <laughs> don't touch that um, but i mean have you ever compared sort of the Porsche classic engines to their com you know, competitors back in the day to see how they were different? Yeah, I mean, it's, I have. I mean, it's difficult to say too much without offending people that might be into <laughs> other brands. But, I mean, I, I, my dad happened to be into to classic cars as well, which okay, is probably yeah. where you know, my initial interest came from. Mm. Um, and he, he had, you know, all sorts of things, but from Jaguars to very old Astons and things like oh, that. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I was always tinkering with things like that. But it was... 
you know, if, if you look at if you look at Porsche engineering for the same year, so say you know nineteen early nineteen seventies, mm -hmm. it's it, Porsche engineering compared to most of the other things I've had any experience with at that time is is so much more refined. Mm. Um, you know, most manufacturers were relying on on big engines to produce power. They were yeah. they were generally over engineered to mm -hmm. make them strong, whereas Porsche engineered them to do what they needed to do. So mm. they weren't. You know, there was no excess anywhere. Yeah, um, you know, they always remind me of like a. It's a terrible cliche, perhaps, but like a Swiss watch. There's yeah. no, there's no excess. You just said there's no excess. No, that's anything. right. No, it's just no. designed. You know. No, I mean, if you look at, I mean, if you look, you know, look at a, a, an engine block off a, a, you know, 1970s Jag or something, which mm. is a massive lump. Mm. Um, you look at the crankcase off a 27 Carrera, for example. You know, it's just a magnesium casting. It's so light. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think that case actually won won awards, design awards at the time, really? I think so, mm. um, you know, because it was, it was an extraordinary bit of engineering in its own right, mm. and, and really, although they changed the material as years went on, that was used right up, you know, till the end of the Metzger Era. engines, yeah. you know, right into the GT3s, GT2s, and GT1, of course. So, and uh, of the, because, um, I mean, you obviously build water-cooled engines as well yeah. as air-cooled engines, but of the air-cooled engines you've built over the years, is there a... And uh, you know I'm not going to pigeonhole you. Is there a particular era in which you just go, everything was as good as it got right at that point? Or um, I think it's difficult to say that because Porsche have always continued to develop. Yeah. So um, I think there's I a think man in Porsche marketing somewhere <laughs> breathing a fire relief. <laughs> I, I, I think I think Porsche have always been good at doing you know having the best product at any given time. Yeah. I mean for again for example, you know, with the 27 Carrera RS, that's a it's a fairly bulletproof engine. Mm. But that magnesium crankcase would be no good on on something like a 33 turbo. It's just not strong enough. But it was more than adequate for a 27 RS. So, yeah. um, you know, but Porsche recognized that and that's why they introduced, you know, silicon alloy cases mm -hmm. later on because they yeah. were much much stronger. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think it's, you know, I think they're they're all good engines. I mean, there's probably been some better than others, but mm. um, some certainly the more exciting than others. But they're, they're they're basically Porsche have always sort of you know developed the the, the strength and and the power hand it's in hand to to make them reliable. I mean, it, you don't really very often see a 911 engine fail of, of the certainly of the air cool stuff. Or you catastrophically, know. no. No, I, I guess no. it's always an evolution rather than, as you said, yeah. minutes back, a, a brand new engine. So they're, yeah. they're honing it and improving uh, it. That's it. Yeah, um, that's it. You, you, you've, I mean, I've read about these, you know, these old fabled stories of Porsche winning Le Mans and the car coming over the line and it's running on like four cylinders yeah. or whatever. What you know? Why can they do that and other other engines can't? What makes them strong enough to do that sort of thing? I don't honestly know. I mean, I don't. I don't know how many of these oh, stories have got much background <laughs> to them, yeah. but. Um, no, I mean they just they just seem to keep going. I, mm. I don't know what it is. I mean, three two Carreras, for example, was road cars. Quite often, if if they were driven in town all their lives, mm. you know, when you took them apart, the, the the piston rings was nothing left. I mean, I have seen them where the, the rings have actually worn through on one side and separated into two pieces. <laughs> I mean, they're that bad. The <laughs> valve guides you could put them. But they keep soldiering on. They keep, still keep going. Yeah. yeah, they don't even they don't even seem to get noisy. They just <laughs> keep going. Um, you know, I, I don't know whether it's the materials that we use for a better quality, or yeah. you know, the design definitely has something to do with it. The thickness I of think, everything, and yeah, and yeah. It's, you know, but yeah, they do. They they just they just seem to keep going. I mean, mechanical failures are, are certainly a rarity. You mm. don't see it very often, and it's usually down to poor maintenance. If if there is a failure, like lack of oil changes, and yeah. you know, as long as they're looked after, mm -hmm. they really they really are amazing. They yeah. keep going. Yeah. They they like being used. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll come back to um, race engines in a second. But mm -hmm. one of the um, other fascinating things I found about you when we first met mm -hmm. about your uh, time with your Merlin engine. Yeah, yeah. Tell I us suppose a bit about that, that comes back to just my general passion for Tinker. anything engine related. <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, I I don't really know where all that came from either. In truth, I I just I have a vague recollection when I was. Oh, I should think probably six or seven years old seeing mm. a, a picture of a Merlin engine in a magazine and just something about the shape of it I just blew me away so sorry again explain what was a Merlin uh, engine to those Merlin, it's a Rolls Royce Merlin engine it's it's basically the engine that was used in a lot of World War Two aircraft um, yeah. primarily Spitfire uh, mm -hmm. Lancaster Mosquito uh, P51 Mustangs mm -hmm. uh, mine actually was originally in a, a Hawker Hurricane so that's oh, that's where that then. came from Rolf Dahl used to fly yeah. them that's um, true he did he did indeed um, um, so yeah I mean that, that's what it is and I just had a I just there was something about it and I always thought oh, it would be 
amazing to find one of them one day mm. and always had this sort of dream that I might find one in a ditch somewhere and <laughs> but you know it was always a pipe dream and nothing yeah. more and then I, I, I literally stumbled across a, a, a chap um, about well, 16 years ago probably now uh, mm. who had, had restored one stuck mm. it on a trailer and ran it and yeah. I thought oh my god somebody else actually <laughs> has these mad ideas as well yeah. and uh, I, I contacted him he's, he's been a good friend ever since and um, yeah it would Cut a very long story short, lots of searching around and, and contacts with people, uh, and I did eventually find one that, that I thought was probably restorable, although you know I had no knowledge of what I was looking. We're at. talking about just the engine, not the whole. Just the engine. Oh, yeah. No, no, <laughs> just the engine. Yeah, I wouldn't have got away with any more than that. <laughs> um, which was up in Wigan, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, two days before Christmas, went up and collected it, and uh, it's still an ongoing project. That was uh, about. 15 years ago I think so what state um, was it in when you picked it up what was um, it what, it, come had, that it last run in 1943 when it was wow. allegedly shot down I, yeah. I, 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 yeah I, I don't know Verbatim, definite detail but, yeah. yeah it's very vague because the, the, there wasn't much not many records kept at the time but it had definitely been it, it had been produced as a spare engine mm -hmm. um, but it had definitely been used you know having taken it apart you could see all the wear on the, the crank and the journals and everything else so mm -hmm. it, it had definitely been used um, and it, like I say allegedly it was it, it, it crashed in 43 um, and to the best of my knowledge it has never been run since mm -hmm. um, so it had been in obviously stalled badly um, there was lots of damage anything made of steel on the outside of it had gone pipe work brackets you know there was it was in quite a bad state mm -hmm. um, but the, the main castings were good yeah um, so yeah that's why it's been such a long job um, you know because so much of it I've had to make um, you know all, all new pipe work and brackets and all that kind of thing so it's been a long long process and there's some again some really I remember you telling me a story about um, something to do with how the engine knows how high it is in the atmospheric yeah, pressure. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I mean, given given when it was designed, sort mm. of mid thirties, it was originally designed. It, it it was very clever, really. In the day, it had um, you know automatic boost control that, that would control the boost pressure depending on altitude, automatic mixture control, mm -hmm. uh, automatic propeller pitch control, and these are all things that previously pilots had had to actually adjust themselves as yeah. well as trying to, you know. You know, maintain their uh, their lives by uh, not getting shot down themselves. So yeah. um, it took a huge amount of workload off of the pilots. Um, mm -hmm. So and it, they're all mechanical devices. I mean, we take that sort of thing for granted now. It's a, just a little black box somewhere doing it all for you. Yeah. But these were all massive assemblies with pistons and springs mm -hmm. and levers and Working hydraulics and, and yeah, like yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it, it, so it, it, yeah. And so you've very had to reverse people. engineer these parts to get this engine working again. Well, so it, 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 yeah, I mean, some of the things like the variable pitch propeller, I mean, I, I'm not, that won't work on mine. I've, I've got friends who have, have restored them and got all that working, but, um, you know, it's all, yeah, I, I, I wasn't too worried about getting that aspect of it working. Mm. Um, it can be done at a later yeah. date, but it, that would be a luxury rather than a necessity. So yeah. uh, I've, I've sort of spent the time doing the things that I need to do to, to, to get the engine running. So, um, but yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it, when I started doing it, you could buy a lot of the parts on eBay. I mean, I bought an enormous <laughs> really? amount of stuff off eBay, yeah. but there's just nothing out there now. So uh, so you have to make it where you can't find yeah, it. And it. Yeah, I mean, fortunately, I'm pretty much, you know, I'm, I'm very near the end of the project now, so mm. uh, there's, there's very little left to make. But um, but yeah, I mean, if anyone that tried to take that on now, I just, I don't know how you would do it. Yeah. Just there isn't anything out there anymore. So. Anyone who's uh, in any uh, sort of, uh, surprise of what this thing looks like mm. google it, it is a, i've yeah. seen it before it's a hulk of an engine isn't yeah, it it's, it's a, a big beast thing. yeah what sort of power will it run when it uh from? that one's rated just under 1500 horsepower so uh christ you have um, to tether it to the floor wouldn't you? yeah i mean in, in truth on the ground it, um generally we, we we wouldn't run them at more than 400 so uh 400 um, bhp yeah. 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 yeah yeah so um you know it's not you know it's well within its limits it's but it's, it, it's rated at, at yeah i think 1400 and something horsepower yeah. Um, at three gallons of fuel a minute it burns so uh, so the, these little uh, 3.6 911 engines <laughs> yeah they're not, not quite on the same scale but <laughs> yeah slightly easier to fix yeah right? <laughs> but um, we, we'll get back on to then the, the race cars cause yeah. you've been lucky enough probably well, I can't think of many engineers that have had this uh, opportunity to work on a variety of uh, historic Porsche race yeah. engines yeah Can you tell us a little bit about that yeah I, 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 yeah I have just been very lucky to, to know people that, that have got those kind of cars and mm. um, you know I, I, it's given me the opportunity to work on things that 
you know you'd never normally get the chance to work on most uh, of these you know, in museums well they're starting to get yeah. used again now well actually. they are yeah, yeah yeah i mean certainly the group group c stuff yeah. um, like the 962s that they're um you know there is a race series for them has been for a few years now so mm. the popularity is, is in, increased on that um things like 935s and stuff it, it, there's not really anything to do with them other than <laughs> have them as, as, as part of a collection but yeah. um but again you know you never know how things are going to go there's, there's so much interest now in historic motorsport that i think yeah. you know there will be more opportunities for these cars to be used again yeah so and so we've got nine nine six two nine five six nine three five yeah not i haven't actually done a nine five six in oh, the okay, literal yeah. sense but i mean that for all intents and purposes that's just a slightly smaller nine six two engine but mm. um yeah nine nine three five nine six two uh the gt1 mm -hmm. um so yeah and you know the, the sort of slightly less racy stuff rsr engines not three liters slightly less and, racy stuff yeah love it <laughs> well, no, no, no turbos just take comparatively the turbos speaking yeah. yeah so um yeah just yeah just yeah, yeah extremely lucky i know I, I am lucky to have had that opportunity to work on those and, of and yeah so. the, the the trust involved in, in doing that because there's you know some of them 150 200 000 pound engines i think oh yeah i mean yeah yeah i mean i yeah i don't know what the engines are worth i mean i think there was a 959 engine for sale um recently for a quarter of a million just just an engine at an auction um, yeah. i don't know whether it's sold or not but i, 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 I also quite like that. some of the uh the hot rod engines that you've built over the years which i've yeah. been lucky enough to both drive and sell and yeah you know, i remember there was a there was a very cool three two um duck egg blue iroc type looking car yeah. i think was that a three two what, what was hot about that one i remember it used to flick flames on idle it was yeah like, yeah i mean it was that wasn't necessarily designed into it <laughs> <laughs> it's a <all> byproduct <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know there seems to be a, a, a sort of thing now for people wanting to make their cars. There, that, <laughs> no, that was that was just yeah. It was on. Um, I can't even remember. That was such a long time ago. I built that one. I can't obviously yeah. remember what was on it. But um, yeah, it would have been just a, a you know, relatively modern engine management system on, mm. on four bodies again. But mm. um, you know, I don't think that one was particularly sophisticated. So uh, it was noisy. Yeah, it was. It was, it was, just, it was just Yeah, it was yeah. just a, a Sunday afternoon fun car. It but was, that's what's you know, quite cool about. It. And again, you just you don't see those sorts of things being built quite in that same way. Because no. I remember that car was built off a two point four S right hand drive shell. Yes. With that engine yeah. and I rock body, yeah. obviously no one chops up a two four S these no, days. It's no, just that's too right. valuable, isn't it? No, back I mean back then, you know, you could buy buy nine eleven shells with paperwork for for not a lot of money, you know, and, and complete with engines. Complete <laughs> with engines, yeah, you know, yeah. and you could buy all the parts, you could mix and match things. I mean, that is the beauty of old nine elevens. You mm. you can so much is interchangeable. It fits within each other. Yeah, you know, yeah. so you can you can take an old sixties shell and put a three two Carrera engine in it or something mm. even bigger, you know. So um you know, it, it lent itself. The brand lent itself to people building these sort of hot rod mm. type things. Um, but as you say now, you know, there's no way you would destroy a, a two four S or something to make a, a hot rod. Oh, I mean, it's no. just it's, it's amazing that people did it even back then. But is there any sort of favourites over the years that you've put together that you think oh, that was a sweet one? Um, they're all so different. So they, they, you know, they all appeal in different ways. Um, I like I, I I still have a soft spot for some of the the sort of proper original cars like three liter RS for example that I did mm. which is just it's just superb it's 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 just how Porsche built it that's rare upon rare super upon rare, rare. Yeah. yeah but it was you know the, the 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 brief was basically to restore it sympathetically to mm -hmm. how it was when it was new but yep. with it, without losing all the, the pattern and the feel of it yeah um, which is actually much harder to do than just simply make it like new again yeah it's very easy to replace everything expensive yep. but very easy <laughs> yeah. um to actually try and retain the feel of an old car mm. in a newly restored car is really difficult to do yeah, yeah um yeah. but that one i'm i'm i, I am really pleased with how that one turned out I mean it was mm. a long time ago we did it but um it just yeah the car just oozes history it's just fantastic and the fact that it sticks in your mind for such a long yeah, time yeah absolutely says, it says volumes yeah if you yeah. were to uh, blank check right build your own project what would you build uh I think for pure drama yeah. probably 962 <laughs> yeah going at the top that, like that, that. <laughs> that would be a blank check book job yes. for sure yeah, yeah so it won't happen it won't be happening but <laughs> Do you um, fit in one? I just about yeah, fit in one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, I have driven that one. It, it, it's, um, yeah, I think it, <laughs> probably because of me, it, it's, it, you sit in. It's more like sitting in the cockpit of an aeroplane than it's sitting in a racing car. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it, the whole thing is just drama to me. Just standing beside it, it just, yeah, just when they're idling, it just, it makes you like your, your lungs yeah. shake against your ribcage, yeah. doesn't it? Absolutely, yeah. I just, I just think they're awesome. I mean, you know, huge respect yeah, the for the guys that, that drove them. 
flat out at you know best part of 250 miles an hour in the day I mean that's that just extraordinary just see, seeing where everything is located your shins yeah. your ankles oh absolutely oof, you don't yeah, want terrifying. to have a knock in one of them do you no absolutely no you're, you're not walking away from no, that no terrifying really. but as, as a piece of engineering I just think they're awesome but that's it that's also oh, I love motorbikes it's mm. kind of what's yeah. in a kind of slightly masochistic way that's its appeal <laughs> that you kind of go that's yeah, absolutely. Boys, that one. Yeah, yeah. For, for sure. Yeah, I mean, there's no, you know, there's no way I'd ever want to drive one of those anywhere near the limit. I certainly don't have the ability. I'm no racing driver. Yeah. Um, but to, to, yeah, to, to experience at least just having a little run round in one is just an how aggressive thing, the yeah. thing is. Yeah. 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 But the thing, they still start on a key, don't they? And they've got oh yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that car will sit for for nine months sometimes, and it'll literally you barely touch the key and it's purring away. Yeah. But again, that's Porsche. You know, I don't, <laughs> I don't think there's many Ferraris that could sit. Sit in a garage for nine months and just start on the button. Don't have raced and won them all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is it. It's an eight hundred yeah. horsepower racing car, and it, it's it, it's as it's as docile, as you know, as as, as, as a as a V two Carrera. You know, it is it is amazing, really. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, yeah. it's, I mean that, that collection of cars is, is mm. something different. But um, so going back on to um, you know what what we do together, and you've mm. done for what eight years with us, nine years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what we've um, so we, uh, we've got some obviously interesting projects with the GT fours mm -hmm. and. What, what other interesting engines have you sort of, um, as Ollie made you do R&D on? <laughs> <laughs> well, as I was say, the 964 mods are, are kind of the big one at the moment, because yeah. um, uh, we've been basically developing a, a complete package. Mm. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, we've looked at every aspect of that. We have our own con rods made, our own barrels and pistons being made. Uh, we, we do our own mods on the, on the cylinder heads for mm. gas flowing. Own profile of cams, um, the throttle bodies. Uh, we've had a lot of input with the manufacturers to get the throttle bodies exactly how we want them. We've gone through all sorts of ideas and things. Um, we're having some carbon work done at the moment, which is quite exciting. That's that's uh, nearing completion um, for an airbox assembly. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, in conjunction with you know down to the finer details like colour schemes for the engine, which <laughs> sounds crazy, but you know if if, if people are going to have something like that built it's got to look the part as well, there's well no there's, point, they there's can't no, see the inside can they no exactly there's yeah. no point doing all of that and it looked exactly the same as a, as a stock engine so mm. um so i, I think we, we i'm really pleased with it i think we've got a really good package now yeah. so uh, and driving a few of the, the the cars that have produced slightly lower power than this yeah. engine you're referring yeah. to being out in them mm. jesus wept those cars shift so with another 25 yeah. percent power up on them yeah but they yeah. we one of the big drivers that ollie's always been focused on is, is torque and daily yeah. usability as well. Yeah, as, absolutely. As yeah, top end. Yeah, I mean we've we've tried all sorts. I mean there's there's no doubt some of the engines we've built they've been you know amazing power outputs. You know mm -hmm. knock, knocking on the door 400. Some of the older engines. Bearing in mind it's a 250 horsepower engine from the factory. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge increase. Yeah. You know we're only going up 200 cc. So it's not just by building a massive it's engine. It's not displacement. It's, no, yeah. no, and they're still normally aspirated. So it, mm -hmm. you know it's great, but with that particular setup, it, it was great for a track day car, mm. but really not very practical as a, as a, as a road car. Yeah. Um, whereas we've done others with, with sort of 265, 270 horsepower, which are just brilliant. They've, they've just got a broad, you know, power delivery and torque delivery right through the range. They're, mm. they're perfectly happy sitting in, in heavy traffic as they are on a track day, you know, and that's, that's a brilliant combination. Because that's something that we've seen evolve over the years as the mm. car values have gone up and the, the clients, you know, requirements have changed yeah maybe 10 years ago you, you wouldn't I wouldn't say you could get away with but you'd say look it's going to be a bit of a grumpy old lady when yeah. she's idling yeah. you have to put up with that nowadays yeah. people kind of go no I'm not interested no in and the thing is you don't need to now that's the yeah, thing that's you know I mean with, with modern MoTeC engine management systems um, you know they're so sophisticated now mm. um, that the, the control over the engine is, is, is amazing we've got yeah. really good guys that do all our mapping work so mm. um, yeah I mean they really are as user friendly as a, as a Oh, standard, yeah. standard, standard product. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah, and, and with the because one thing that always kind of makes me smile sometimes when you listen to, for example, you know, journalist reviews of the nine eight one Cayman and seven one eight Cayman GT fours, um, sort of with the nod to the gearing, which which is mm -hmm. obviously quite long, but it's it's something that you've actually done Cramble and Pinions on mm -hmm. since the nine nine six era of GT three yeah. because people yeah. knocked them for that, didn't they? Yeah, they did. I mean, I. I, I you know, I think there's there's probably more to it than we're aware of in terms of how I think you know manufacturers like Porsche are, are quite limited by so many other regulations. Yes. I mean, I know I, I can't remember the, the exact um, model now, but I know there was there were, I think it was one of the earlier 911s um, 
something weird like the Swedish market, <laughs> they actually had to have different gear ratios because right. it failed the n noise emissions yeah. in Sweden for, for a particular gear ratio. So, I mean, it, it, it's bizarre what it's manufacturers have to meet. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, yeah, from the 996 GT3 onwards, I mean, yeah, I, I was getting literally people were buying cars, dry, picking them up from the, the dealer, driving them straight into the workshop and I was pulling brand new gearboxes apart to put cup car final drives in. Back in the early 2000s. Yeah, yeah. And you wonder now because obviously I see these cars come through as a yeah, sales car yeah. and we used to see, especially with air cool cars actually, where the car had had an engine rebuild mm -hmm. and it maybe wasn't so fashionable to have had an engine rebuild 15 years ago because mm -hmm. it was a sort of a, oh gosh, something's failed. Yeah. So the receipt went in the bin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so I'd get these cars through, and you go, "Christ, that engine feels good." Yeah. But there's no receipt of it ever being built, sure. and it's done 150k. And I start, yeah. I'm starting to think nowadays with 996 GT3s, where yeah. someone's gone, "Oh, it's got a different crown and pinion." I'm, yeah. I'm not sure if that's good or bad. And some cars we do find it feel quicker than others. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I don't know if it's down to that. Sometimes it could be. I mean, it does make an enormous difference. Mm. Um, I mean, the trade-off obviously is the top speed, but but most of these cars, the top speed capability is way beyond what most people are ever going to use. So you might just as well have the the, the better performance lower down. So. Well, it's a really good point because didn't we count or you calculated that the GT4 was geared to 201 miles an hour or something standard? I, I, yeah, I, I, I can't remember, but I, I I know that people have done. I mean, again, I've, I've got nothing to. to prove it but I have heard that people have done various calculations and on, on for example like a, a 996 GT3 the, by putting the cup car final drive in mm. it, the, the, if you discount the top speed reduction um, the improvement in performance was equivalent to having to get about 50 or 60 horsepower extra out of the engine well those engines to get any more power out of those engines is so difficult because they're so highly tuned anyway yeah um, so and, and, and you know to try and get another 60 horsepower out of one of those engines you'd spend a fortune mm. so by comparison to get the same improvement in performance generally for the cost of a cup car final drive and the labor to swap it out it, it was no brainer yeah absolutely yeah. yeah yeah i mean unless you for some reason in an environment where you can drive it you know v max all the time it, it you really aren't losing anything okay. it, it's all it's all gain and i guess learning from that you know 20 at that point might have been 20 odd years of gt3 mm. 18 years of gt3s being around is that how you and ollie sort of worked out what would have been a sensible reduction ratio on the gt4 so yeah you know, top out at like yeah 10. Ab absolutely yeah. yeah that's right yeah i mean it, it, it's um i mean the, the things with anything like this it's all it's all yeah, you know, one driver might have a different opinion as to what they want from another. I mean, yeah. consequently, we, we do the the low ratio crown wheel opinion on the GT fours um, and and the similar cars, um, which works brilliantly. But mm. some people don't; they'd rather have a a, um, a higher sit still, yeah. um, for especially if they spend a lot of time say on the autobahn or something like that. They don't; mm. they want to bring the revs down mm. at the top end, so it becomes you know so Pretty so good. consequently, yeah, yeah. We, we do a different sit gear ratio. Yeah. So we can do the crown wheel opinion, opinion in, in conjunction with the sixth gear. Mm -hmm. um, so that obviously then drops gears one to five down to mm. give you a much more you know, lively performance um, low down. But then your sixth gear is almost like an overdrive gear. Yes. Um, you're not going to use it on the track generally. Um, so it just means that if you're using the car as a, as a you know, commuter as well, mm -hmm. you can pop it into sixth gear when you're on the motorway and it, it, it's, it's just as comfortable as your standard setup. And with the lightweight clutch and flywheel combination within that you know, mm -hmm. does that put any extra stress through the transmission or is it is it is it fine no no i mean it, it, it primarily just takes more weight out of the, 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 good thing. the, the whole system yeah um you know whereas the you know if you've got a, a, a double mass flywheel for example that's that's where your damping is done mm -hmm. but it's a very heavy unit yeah so if we take that out and put a single mass flywheel on then the center plate the clutch has the springing in it so you're still you're you know you're still absorbing it yeah you know I mean, I mean most cars have you know all manufacturers now have some sort of double mass flywheel thing because it's quieter softer easier you know, to manipulate exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. you know and for day to day driving when you're just driving to and from work that's what people want because mm. um, it always makes me chuckle when we uh, yeah, obviously when we tell people about mm. lightweight clutch and flowers we always say it's, yeah, it's going to rattle when the clutch isn't mm. pressed and then when it does rattle, they kind of look yeah. at it like, is, is it supposed to be that noisy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like when I when we sold uh, 997 RSs, brand new, yep. the, the guys and girls that bought them from it never even sat in the car before because sure. you just order it blind and they'd come and collect it, yeah. and put their foot on the clutch and then listen to it and be like yeah. horrified at the noise. But No, that's right. I mean, you know, if you go back to something like a 964 RS, um, mm. which had very limited sound deadening and everything, you know, um, and that, that had a single mass 
flywheel and clutch from from new um and they do you know you sit in that and it, it rattles like crazy <laughs> you, and think, oh. you know yeah it sounds like it's about to fall to pieces i suppose it's made worse because you've got the transmission yeah right the engine sort of hips basically yeah absolutely yeah. Like i mean all the yeah. noise and vibration gets transmitted through the car anyway but it, it's um yeah, they sound horrendous, but that, that is just how they are, you know. And um, so I think when people have got in, you know, more modern cars got used to double mass flywheels that, that take so much of that away. Yes. Of course, when you go back to what was perfectly acceptable 15, 20 years ago, mm. now it seems, you know, people think there's something wrong with it. But. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and it's, it's funny, and it would be interesting in 10 years' time, sort of what modifications we're doing then. And mm. it's going to be in that, sooner or later, someone's going to ask us to take a PDK transmission apart. Mm. Have you ever taken one of the dual? No, I, I haven't, to be honest. No, mm. I mean, the, 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 you know, the specialists that do just PDK type transmissions. Mm. Um, so. I mean, we haven't actually had many issues with them, to I be honest. I was literally about to say, there's, there's no so, mods that anyone's ever asked no, us to do, and there's, no. there's never, touch wood, we haven't had any failures. So. No, no, I think that generally anything we have seen has been more electronic problems yeah, rather than mechanical. Agree. So, um, mm. so no, I mean, the time may come when, you know, as they get older with more and more miles on, we might start to see some mechanical issues. But mm. at this stage, no, it's, I, I haven't actually had a look inside one of those no, yet. So, so watch this space. Well, yeah. I guess it will depend on uh, what uh, electric Porsches run there. Well, quite, yeah. Transmission yeah. series. Because a lot of them have a single single speed box or something. Box yeah, I'm not I'm not very clued up on, on electric the, this cars. new incoming <laughs> stuff, to be honest. But um, no, it'll be interesting to see how that all moves forward. Mm. Um, yeah, I th from what I gather, there's all sorts of different ways from some that have obviously motors in the wheels and no yeah. gearbox or transmission at all, mm -hmm. and others that do run through a gearbox. So um, yeah, I think everyone's finding their own way with, with the technology on those at the moment. So uh, whether it'll ever become uniform, I don't know. No, it's interesting mm. stuff. Well, um, um, I personally could sit here for hours talking to Dave, and I sometimes do, um, much to probably his annoyance. But um, hopefully, anyone listening's found that found that interesting. I hope so. Yeah. Thanks for taking time out, Dave. I know you're literally midway through doing a GT4 Cromwell and Pinion yeah. as we speak, so we'll put some photos online of that. But mm -hmm. uh, needless to say, if anyone out there needs any help with uh, engines or transmissions, uh, do give us a call. I won't be able to help you, but uh, if you're lucky, Dave might be around, <laughs> um, and obviously uh, Ollie can help as well. So um, yeah, thanks for listening and uh, we'll see you all soon.